Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Kathy Wallerstein, the Associate Director of the UC Davis Humanities Institute, along with Global Affairs, Human Rights Studies, the Hemispheric Institute of the Americas, Spanish and Portuguese, and History. We are delighted to be bringing you this dialogue with scholars from Chile about some of the sources of discontent that gave rise to the October 2019 social uprising in Chile and the possibilities for democratic reform following the historic October 25th, 2020 plebiscite. In a record turnout, Chileans overwhelmingly voted in favor of writing a new constitution to replace the Pinochet regime's 1980 constitution. Still, in today's neoliberal, neoliberal Chile, the legacies of dictatorship remain, and Chile remains one of the most socioeconomically unequal countries in the world. What prospects exist for change in Chile? How do ongoing human rights abuses in the present invoke memories of a darker past? What do struggles for justice and dignity look like in Chile today? These are some of the questions that our distinguished panelists will address in a conversation moderated by Professors Michael Lazara and Marion Schlotterbeck. I would now like to introduce our panelists. Claudio Barrientos holds a PhD in Latin American history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is an associate professor of history at the Universidad Diego Portales in Santiago, Chile. Hilary Hilner, or Heiner, sorry, holds a PhD in history from the Universidad de Chile and is an associate professor of history at the Universidad Diego Portales. Romina Green Rioja, holds a PhD in Latin American and World History from the University of California, Irvine, and is a postdoctoral fellow in the Faculty of Economics and Administration at the Universidad de Santiago. Our moderators are Michael Lazaro, Associate Vice Provost of Programs at Global Affairs and Professor of Latin American Literature and Cultural Studies, and Marian Schlotterbeck, Professor of Modern Latin American History, specializing in 20th century Chile. Um, I will now turn it over to Marian and Michael. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I just wanted to, again, uh, extend a word of welcome to everybody and uh, to thank our, our friends and distinguished colleagues who've joined us today for this conversation. Uh, and particularly, I, I wanted to thank the DHI uh, for hosting us today. Uh, Jamie Fisher, uh, you, Kathy, and Gina Nunes have all been uh, instrumental in, in setting up this webinar. Uh, and I know that we've got hopefully a lot of students uh, who are joining today as well. I'm doing a class this quarter on uh, contemporary Chile. Uh, so uh, I know a bunch of my students are here and also uh, students from the human rights courses and some of the history courses as well. So I'll hand it over to Marion who will uh, tell us about the format. Great, fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to start with two rounds of questions for each of our panelists and then open it up to audience submitted questions. I want to go ahead and invite everyone who's joining us from home to please go ahead and submit your questions through the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom webinar. The first question I'm going to pose for Claudio to get us started, and that is what led to the October 2019 social uprising in Chile? What were some of the sources of people's discontent? Okay, well good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, here in Chile is 5 p.m. so it's pretty afternoon almost evening. Uh, uh, happy to see you all, especially Romina, uh, who I've uh, been contacted by mail or uh, heard about her, but never, seen, never met her in person, and now I'm meeting her virtually. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure being in, in this event. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to apologize for my English. I haven't taught or spoken English in a very long time, so uh, I'll try to be uh, as clear as possible in my presentation or in my response to my answer to your question. What uh, led to um, October 18, right? Uh, so what are the sources of discontent? There are several uh, different sources. It's not, a, it's not an easy question and it's not, it's not a, uh, an easy question to um, answer briefly. I think there's a long process. There's, there, there are different processes, uh, uh, um, different events and moments in the history of the transition to democracy from 1990 that have uh, had led to this moment in Chile, and, uh, not just uh, October 18, 2019, but to the uh, constitutional moment that we are experiencing and that we are living right now. I think it was a long process of different moments of social uprising. Chile's transition to democracy um, has been 
a sort of extension of the dictatorship in so many ways. Most people say that our transition to democracy was a very complicated process with the armed forces holding a lot of, uh, a lot of power uh, at the moment of the transition until Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London in 1998. However, the main problems uh, of our transition to democracy started earlier when political parties accepted a transition to democracy under the rule of the constitution of the 1980, of the year of 1980, the, the, the Pinochet's constitution. This path was taken early in 1984 when Patricio Elwin in a seminar in Santiago at the, Con at the Conrad Adenauer Foundation proposed a negotiated transition to democracy under the timing and the processes established in the 1980 constitution. After that, under President Elwin's administration, most politicians understood that producing a political transition to democracy was a, was a possibility or was possible just by keeping or maintaining the neoliberal economic system. Uh, in that fashion, it would allow uh, important transformation towards human rights and, democrat and political democratizations in our country. However, the neoliberal system in Chile needed a political and social status quo in order to work. It was created with public and state funding in the middle of a catastrophic economic crisis with important structural uh, reforms in education, health, and social security. These reforms provided the new and to the new entrepreneurial class uh, with enormous funding from the state, a very precarious and unstable labor market that provided cheap labor force and easy sources for cheap and uh, uh, unprotected employment. And also a very unstable and a very uh, debilitated uh, union system of union organizations in, in the country. So, uh, therefore, to keep the neoliberal system under a new democratic regime meant also to keep the social inequalities and political restrictions to, democ to, de to democratic and social organizations. And therefore, also to keep or to maintain the neoliberal system also uh, meant to maintain the status quo of, uh, in terms of social inequalities and in terms of the structure of the social and economic system in Chile. So, Having that in mind, the main event that started a process of social uprising and discontent were the student process, uh, protests in 2006, 2011, 2018, and 2019. In those years, the uh, high school students and university students protested for the inequalities in the educational systems and the inefficiencies in the educational system. In 2011, the main issue was uh, public funding for students at the universities. And in 2018, they protested against a, a special law that Piñera's government passed in Congress called Secure Classrooms or Aulas Seguras, which was a special law to uh, persecute and uh, incarcerate any uh, person, any students from high school, from the high school uh, system that will participate in any violent protest or any other kind of strike uh, within the, the educational system. And in 2019, well, the, 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 is, uh, in October, it started the, pro the, the problem with the uh, rise of the uh, price of the uh, metro system and, and the public transportation in Chile. It did not affect directly to the high school students, but they started the process. And this elevated and was escalated until the whole society was immersed, immersed in a, a social crisis and in a social people that led to the a constitutional moment we are experiencing right now. In, the, in 2018 also, the feminist movement also erupted again in Chile, protesting and demanding reproductive rights, but also uh, gender rights in terms uh, in, in, in the universities, you know, uh, exposing and demanding uh, uh, cases of social, uh, sexual harassment and irregularities in terms of gender relationships uh, within the uh, classrooms and within the uh, university system. And other movements again, uh, and also in these years, other movements appeared and other movements emerged against the, so the, the social security system, especially against the uh, low income retirement plans in Chile. 
So the main issues are basically inequalities in education, access to health, the, uh, the retirement plans in Chile, people who retire in Chile from the uh, system, uh, so the, from the social security system called AFP, uh, administradoras de fondos de pensiones, yeah, are getting very low monthly incomes from the pensions. So this is becoming a major uh, crisis in a big demographic uh, section of our population. And so these are the main, uh, the main sources of this, uh, of this content. But the main source of this content is the, that the uh, economic and social neoliberal system in Chile uh, implemented in, uh, during the dictatorship and continued and uh, preserved during the transition to democracy over 30 years is, wasn't working. And it was uh, producing uh, major structural inequalities, major structural uh, problems in access to education, health, social security, etc. And so that's uh, may, uh, the, main, the main issue. And the main issue here is how the uh, neoliberal system became so violent and became so uh, uh, problematic for Chilean society. It's because during the transition to democracy, most uh, traditional political parties and most uh, political leaders in the 1980s accepted the rules of the dictatorship and accepted to maintain the constitution and the neoliberal system, believing or uh, in, a very naively, uh, in a very naive way, they thought uh, that by preserving the, status, the, the economic status quo and preserving the constitution, they will have the chance to produce reforms and to produce major changes towards uh, political memory and truth and human rights uh, as soon as the uh, transition started and also introducing little by little major democratic uh, uh, reforms into the constitutions. The problem was that the neoliberal system always needed, since the beginning, since its origins, always needed social inequality, needed uh, this, uh, uh, social differences and economic differences and restrictions to the access of social rights like education, health, and social security. So this is a status quo that the neoliberal system in Chile needed to, uh, to exist, to continue uh, to keep uh, existing. And uh, by preserving it, they also have to preserve, and they also have to keep uh, this status quo, and they could produce very little reformations, very little uh, reforms in terms of social rights, economic rights, and different other uh, rights as gender also, but also environmental and uh, uh, political uh, democratization in terms of memory and human rights also. That would be my answer. Great, Th thank you so much, Claudio. I think, uh, I think you've given us a great basis for kind of understanding some of the underpinnings of uh, what led to, to October 2019. And, and especially, you know, you've kind of hinted at how over time that those original pacts and status quo became eroded uh, little by little and, and in major ways, uh, you know, starting last October. So I wanted to turn to Hillary and uh, evoke a, a slogan that really circulated widely uh, around October 2019. It was Chile cambió. Uh, Chile changed. I, I think just about every article that I read about what was happening in Chile then uh, cited this slogan. Uh, and so I wanted to turn that to you to, to ask, in, in what ways do you think Chile changed as of, as of that time? And what do you think will be some of the lasting effects of that change? Um. Yeah, I also wanted to just say thanks so much for inviting me. And um, I actually am not in Chile. I am in California, which um, my colleague Claudio knows, eh, because of problems with COVID and cuidados, no? which is another huge eh, topic that we're dealing with. Um, and um, I think that what you're saying about Chile cambió, I think it's interesting because, uh, of course, the other big slogan is Chile despertó, no? That's the yeah. other, you know? And, um, and the interesting thing, at least uh, with where I'm coming from a lot with is from feminist groups, right? I'm a feminist historian, and so that's sort of where most of my political activism as well comes from, is that I think it's interesting that for a lot of our feminist groups and sort of feminist discussions on that is like, 
well, las feministas nos despertamos hace rato, ¿no? O sea, esa idea, ¿no? That we have already been woke, ¿no? We have already changed. And I think that that is, um, that's something that I think is kind of shared with a lot of, going back to what Claudio was saying as well, ¿no? With the, the sort of perception of having been at least 10 years deep into massive protests and massive social mobilizations basically every year. I mean, yeah. it started in 2006, right? But I think that from 2011 on, you sort of really feel it, especially at universities where almost every year you've got Tomas, you've got Paros, you've got, you know, some kind of demand going on. And, and I think as well, too, the interesting thing about that is how much feminism and also LGBTQ activism has really permeated those spaces, as well as some ethnic and racial mobilizations as well, depending on the region in Chile, right? But also having Mapuche students, you know, having a migrant students, Afrodescendientes, I think that's also been like, really come to the fore in like at least the last five years. It also has to do with massive migration to Chile, which has really changed the face of Chile as well uh, within, you know, the last five to 10 years. So I think that when I think of Chile Cambio, it's like within, I think a range of years that it's kind of like, well, okay, el estallido is like the sort of big point where that sort of comes to the surface, like the tip of the iceberg, but then underneath that is like so many recent years of protest and social mobilization and to get to this point. And I think that part of that also has to do with just like el desgaste, right? Like this, like you just can't keep going on, not only with neoliberalism, but I think also with the political system, right? I think that was a big part. And I think that's also why the Revuelta Social is so interesting is because um, out of the student movements, it seemed like sort of the answer to, you know, these problems are, okay, new political parties. So you have the Frente Amplio, right? And you have all of these political parties that came out of student mobilization. But now with the estallido, it's like, oh, Frente Amplio is Nueva Concertación, right? Like yeah. that's not going to help us at all. Like we're, you know, so then you'd see people from Frente Amplio as well. I mean, there's a couple of very well-known cases like Bori or Sanchez that like went to the protests and were just attacked and like nobody wanted to hear what they had to say, right? They were like, <laughs> traidores, like we're, no estamos ni ahí. And I think too, the, that also has to do with what ended up happening, happening with regard to what Claudio said, which is that now we're in this process of new constitution. You know, there was the acuerdo that was signed uh, in November, 2019. And so it sort of opened up this, okay, well, the, the way that we're gonna sort of move forward from this is through a new constitution, right? But I think uh, in, Practical terms, like what we had in, you know, this big vote vote at the end of October and like, it was so amazing, 80%, you know, we're all in the streets, people are so happy, people are, you know, apruebo, convención constitucional, and I think that that was like, that was, I think, a moment of hope, which is so, which are so few in Chile, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like, I think that it was something that was, you know, really amazing to have that moment. But now we're sort of in that moment, okay, how do we actually elect the, you know, Convención Constitucional? Mm -hmm. And again, now we're seeing these problems with political parties. And so I think that's to sort of go to your question with what has changed and what hasn't changed. I think what hasn't changed is that what we've seen in the last 10 years is a lot of skepticism and pessimism with regard to the political system in Chile, with regard to political parties. I know within feminism, that's always been a huge issue, and I don't think it's really changed that much. Uh, although in these new sort of leftist parties are also parties that identify as openly feminist, uh, Sanchez as well, right? Mm. Um, but I think, so that's still something that we're kind of seeing what's going to happen. And I think that in the Convención Constitucional, we've seen it, you know, with a lot as well, people saying, well, you know, it's just going to be the same old as well, political parties taking over these spaces. We can't really make any real changes. Maybe the constitution will turn out worse. You've seen it now with the uh, escaños reservados that they don't want to approve in Congress. Uh, you saw it too as well. There recently were primaries. Very few people participated, and there was also a lot of questioning and criticisms towards political parties. So I think it's kind of yes. A, I think what's changed is sort of the the horizon of um, expectativas, right? Like the possibilities of change. I think ha it has been more hopeful. 
But at the same time, I think there also have been recurring problems with regard to political parties and neoliberalism and the Pedro Padrecalo, right, which haven't really uh, changed. And I think that we still are sort of seeing like what needs to be done to make those changes. And some things are going to be very, you know, long, long haul, right, largo plazo. But, um, but I think as well, too, there's certain aspects there with regard to particularly democracy, citizenship, and political parties, which I think is very hard to resolve. And I think that's something that we're currently seeing. Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, before I, I ask a follow-up question for Romina, I just want to continue to invite the audience to submit questions. We've had several great ones come in already. Please use the Q&A function that's down there on the far right of the Zoom webinar. So building off of Claudio and Hillary's comments, Romina, uh, I want to kind of pose a, a kind of broader question, particularly because you uh, very much are kind of situated between Chile and the United States. So protests against neoliberalism, systematic racism, inequality, sexual, ethnic, and gender discrimination are happening not only in Chile, but all over the world. Black Lives Matter movement has been a notable example in the United States. How do you see Chile in a global perspective? How does the Chilean experience articulate the experience of other countries and communities around the world in this moment? Um, well, first, I want to thank uh, Professors Lazara and Schlauterbeck for the invitation, as well as the departments and programs that um, organize this. And, um, and also for this panel, because I think it's actually very kind of needed uh, to talk about these things. Um, when I, I was, you know, I was going back and forth on how to answer this question and um, why I think it's really interesting because there Chile is being confronted, I think, more so with the politics of the world, right? More so than ever before. So I was thinking what came to me was first and uh, not something that I was present at, but something that became kind of like a known thing that happened. Uh, and I had friends who were there, which was during uh, a April 2018 uh, vigil held by uh, Chilean feminists um, after the six months uh, since the death of a Haitian immigrant named Joan Florville, who was uh, murdered in police custody. And at that vigil, um, you know, it's bringing together feminist groups, immigration groups and such, right? Um, a Chilean artist showed up and she was um, to do a, a spontaneous kind of like dance routine and she was painted entirely in blackface. Uh, and now, a few days later, uh, one of the Afro-feminist groups uh, or collectives known as Micro Sesiones Negras wrote a Facebook uh, post uh, condemning the performance. And, but I think also besides condemnation, it was also like they saw it as an opportunity for education because they knew that most likely a lot of the feminists there had no idea what happened, like why it was bad, what it meant, what, what even means, you know, what is blackface, like, what is it? Uh, and I noticed that it sparked a, a big debate within the feminist movement, also because of their connections with the immigration movement too, with the, especially with the, not just the Haitian immigration movement, which, you know, uh, that was present there, um, but also Peruvian and Afro-Colombian and such that has been increasing over the years. And I felt like uh, then it forced, I received a bunch of WhatsApp uh, messages from some of my feminist friends who were like, what is this? I know you're from the United States, so you must understand what this means. And they kind of, uh, instead of being entirely defensive, they realized that they needed to know this. They needed to educate themselves. And they started educating themselves on what the term meant, but also I noticed that they became more interested to learn about uh, the history of race struggles related in the United States, uh, even more, even especially with Black Lives Matter. Like we organize panels online, we organize discussions because of this kind of connection. And I think this really kind of struck me as like this moment where the Chilean, some of the Chilean feminist friends who were there present and experienced this, you know, this kind of like, you know, I would say 
having to come to terms with that Chile has is part of the global politics, is part of these networks of uh, migration, is part of these like discussions on race, which for those of us who are either Chilean or study Chile know that race has been a topic that doesn't is not discussed a lot, hasn't been until very recently. And it always was treated as something that we have, we have issues with class, not race, or ra race is something only uh, associated with what it, I would say what racial beings. Like if you talk about race, it has to do with Mapuche. But as a Chilean who is like mixed or not, it's race is irrelevant. But now these questions are there. They have to be discussed and they have to be, you know, understood. So I, I just, I think that in a sense it's open Chileans more so than ever, like now Black Lives Matter or the struggles that happen in the United States, uh, in comparison, I would say some years back with the, um, with the previous uh, uprisings uh, in the United States, that it was seen more as like, oh, that is U.S. politics. But I noticed that there has been a shift of like, like actually this is reveling here, it's happened here. There's, you know, uh, like there are people who are harassed by police, by, by just regular Chileans for their race. There is anti-black racism in Chile. So I think there, um, that is something that I would say that connects that part of like global politics, uh, migration kind of networks, uh, race politics, and also gender all kind of combine into one. Thank you so much, uh, Romina. I, I wanted to, uh, in, a way, in a way, build on that and uh, turn back to Claudio uh, to talk a little bit more about the constitutional process that lies ahead, because I think, I think Hillary, you said earlier, it's going to be a long road, uh, yeah. and it's, it's, not, it's not a change that's going to happen overnight. Uh, so really, the process is going to unfold over the next one to two years. And I'm wondering, Claudia, what you think are some of the prospects for this process as you see them right now? Uh, I know that there's uh, are already talking uh, about uh, gender parity and the inclusion of indigenous peoples uh, within, within that process. What are some of the hopes, the fears, and, and maybe the obstacles that exist uh, on the road that lies ahead? <laughs> okay. Um... As you can see, we are not a very optimistic, optimistic panel. <laughs> we are kind of pessimistic <laughs> and critical of what is going on. Uh, I mean, well, we're happy that, uh, about everything that's going on here, but uh, we have a very skeptical uh, point of view about uh, all the process. Uh, but um, generally, there are different kinds of um, uh, uh, consensus that are going on right now in Chile. And that uh, is a very paradoxical situation in which you can see some prospects, but also those, pro those prospects also uh, articulate their own contradictions and their own obstacles. So, uh, but the major and more, more important prospect is that most of the Chilean population, most of the Chilean voters uh, agree to a new constitution starting from scratch and not, uh, and this is not a redundant or a very easy thing to say because it was a long process and was a, a, a violent process in terms of how do we got to how, how did we get to this point in which most uh, seventy five percent of the, of the voters think that we need a new constitution and we need and and, uh, and we need a new constitution from, from scratch not based on the uh, current constitution of the year 1980 and I think that's a big uh, accomplishment itself uh, but at the same time uh, also there's a common uh, interest in agreement in terms of how our model of neoliberalism doesn't work and and it's not working at all it does not provide uh, social security uh, it doesn't provide also um, fair future retirement uh, COVID-19 has shown that our health system and our unemployment uh, insurance system and our labor market do not work either. Uh, the state had no strategies to implement a good system of financial aids for the poorest families in the country. And this COVID crisis also proved that we do not have a healthy labor market. There are a, an important number of people who live on a daily basis. If they sell something on the streets, they get something to eat that day. Otherwise they would starve. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, there's a, uh, 
a big part of the population who could not uh, observe or could not keep the quarantines during the hard period of the quarantine because uh, they have to get out of their homes and uh, do something to eat that day. So uh, this is a, a major uh, opening, uh, eye-opening uh, situation in which the Chilean society has faced, uh, faced itself with these contradictions, with these social inequalities, and there's a sort, sort of agreement that our economic system is not working and our social system is also not working. So therefore also there's a consensus or there's a, a certain idea that the constitution needs to provide a new definition and nature uh, for this, the role of the state you know, in the economy and the social welfare. So we need to build a new, a new concept of the state uh, because uh, right now the, the, the kind of state and the welfare state uh, system we have is not working. However, this consensus works at, a politi uh, at different political levels, only in progressive parties, social movements and social organizations. But the right-wing parties and the government are still living in a bubble with no connection to reality, not knowing how people live, not really knowing how people survive with low incomes. A study from Los Angeles University, which is a very conservative university, so keep that in mind, you know, they pass a survey on entrepreneurs, academics, and, and uh, people from the economic and social elite in Chile. And it showed that they thought that 57% of the Chilean population uh, was part of the middle class, of the, what, what, is understand, what is understood as middle class. However, numbers in terms of income and uh, education and access to uh, different kinds of services have shown that only 20% of, of the Chilean population belong to that social group. So they're not considered really middle class. And almost 75% in terms of income information are considered poor in Chile. So this elite also overestimated the number of people affiliated to the system of private health insurance system. They thought they almost 39% of, of the population in Chile was able to pay the, the, the private health insurance system in Chile, when in fact only 18% of the people is registered or affiliated to any sort of institution that provides private health insurance for the population. So this, is, uh, this, is the, uh, uh, this shows how, although there's an agreement in terms of that we, what we need in terms of inequalities, uh, this agreement is mostly uh, stated or constructed among progressive parties, social movements, and social organizations because the right-wing elite and people in government are still totally distanced and totally separated from reality and from the uh, reality of the, of the major part of the Chilean population. Also, there's a good proper, uh, prospect, uh, I would like to say, in fact, that people are tired of traditional politicians and also tired of traditional political parties. There are emerging candidates uh, to the constitutional assembly from different social movements. However, the rules uh, for them to run for a seat in the constitutional assembly are really hard without the support of a political party. So there's this good thing that people are just turning their attention to new different leaders from social movements and social organizations. However, at the same time, for these people it's really hard to run for a, for, a seat, for a seat at the Constitutional Assembly without the support of and, and the whole structure of a political party. So there's, the, the, there's this very paradoxical situation which people are looking for different forms of politics and different forms of, different forms of politicians trying to build a new form of democracy, but at the same time, the structure of the system to, uh, to elect uh, and vote for new leaders is really uh, weak in terms uh, and favor most uh, of the traditional political parties. So that's, uh, that's a, a, a good point, but it's also a contradiction itself in that, in that situation. Social movement has placed into political debate important issues such as gender reproductive rights, LGBT rights, as uh, Hillary said before, indigenous rights and plurinational state. However, these are the best organized movements and these movements have been fighting and struggling with the state since the beginning of the transition to democracy since day one of 1990. However, so, however there are other movements like uh, students movements and young protesters who have a, a, a really creative strategy of protest like jumping over the, over the metro uh, 
of, of the metro system or um, colla uh, collapse in the metro system in terms of uh, uh, impeding the, the, the race of the, of the price of the, of the metro system. But at the same time, all these young uh, protesters, all these uh, students' movements, high school movements, and university, university movements, they, do, they, they have a really good experience protesting since 2006, 2011 on. However, they have not articulated a clear political agenda and they have not articulated uh, and, and they have not posted a permanent debate on the issues they, uh, they are really concerned with. So, uh, although there are different movements like women's movement, LGBT movement, indigenous movements that have placed into the, uh, the public sphere and the, and the political debate important issues that are going to be discussed in the in the next constitutional assembly there are others who provoked even who created this situation of constitutional moment but i think i'm going to be uh, left behind because they don't have a proper representation and they don't have uh, leaders or a, a political discourse that will place their agenda and their demands on the table i think that's uh, that's the situation i, I, I uh, that's how i see the situation in terms of uh, Prospect, uh, perspectives and, 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 and just uh, what is going to be positive in this, in this situation and what is, are the obstacles and the problems that we are facing in this situation also. Thank you so much, Claudio. We're going to pivot to our first audience submitted question, uh, which I'm going to pose to Hillary. Uh, and this one comes from graduate student Cynthia Ammerman, who asks if you could please expand, uh, again, kind of following up on, on Claudio's comments about prospects for constitutional change. What do you see as the potential impact that the new constitution will have for the sovereignty and territorial restitution of the pueblos originarios? Is there a discussion about how the new constitution could potentially alter the timber industry subsidies and land holdings under DL 701? Um, well, I'm not like a super expert on <laughs> all of the ins and outs of uh, DL 701. What I can say is that a, what I mentioned a little bit earlier is that I think that it's been interesting to see the differences between how par gender parity was approved versus all of the different sort of tensions and conflicts with regard to Escaños Reservados, right, the reserved mm -hmm. seats. Um, where, you know, basically, you know, I, I know some political feminist political scientist friends who were very active in the Red de Politologas that started working on this idea of gender parity basically, I think, about a year ago. So I want to say like November, December 2019, and managed to sort of get together, you know, the skeleton of the, the, the law, you know, for gender parity and in a very short amount of time and start lobbying very strongly, right? And not only lobbying a center or left-wing parties, but even knowing they had to have votes from right-wing parties as well. And they really targeted women, right? Women politicians and right-wing parties. And, and so that gender par parity aspect of the Convención was passed in early March. And I think that process was very speedy and uh, considering you know, how most of the time the Congress is very slow. And um, and I think that that was interesting because it sort of uh, evoked a lot of discussion about, you know, what does gender parity mean uh, in terms of sort of like liberal feminism and quotas and, you know, what is, is parity really going to be, you know, that um, important for Chilean feminism or Chilean feminist groups. And I think that there was a lot of talk as well, especially from a Chilean feminist who identify as being from a indigenous groups or also a African diaspora, a, you know, sort of being like, well, you know, parity doesn't really guarantee, you know, that we're going to have people that are going to represent us, right? There's, there's you know, what, what happens if, you know, the women who are voted into the Convención Constitucional uh, are really right-wing white women who, you know, are just going to try to uphold the status quo. And I think there has been discussion then about like, well, what type of uh, 
you know, women need to be voted into the Convención Constitucional. And at the same time, in getting a little bit back to the question, I think that that's also part of the reason why the Escaños Reservados have been so resisted by right-wing political parties from the very beginning. And, and that's because they feel like having these Escaños Reservados, so there's basically a total of 155 seats in the Convención Constitucional. I, I'm explaining this because the, the system for uh, electing people in the Convención Constitucional is the same as electing parliament. So it's the de system uh, for the representatives, right? So it's based on the size of the district and that is how many people get elected and then lists are presented. And then depending on how well the list does, you get a certain amount of seats depending uh, on the list, right? And so basically the the whole idea behind this as well is because part of that you know uh, dictatorship legacy was the binomial system right which is basically mm. two lists right one is the concertacion one is the the derecha and it's different names but it's basically always been renovacion nacional and udi right and then a few smaller parties and um and I think that the idea there with uh, the system, the, the own system is that it opens up for a third list. And the third list generally, at least for the last parliamentary election has been Frente Amplio, right? Uh, now they're trying to say, well, we have to see what's gonna end up happening in terms of having lists that could be independents uh, and see if that also could factor in. But it's very difficult in terms of financing. And I think Claudia talked a little bit about that, right? And so within this 155 seats, there also is the idea, well, which of, which of these seats should be reserved and why should they be reserved? And what the, you know, the, the groups of eh, pueblos originarios and afrodescendientes are saying is they should get a certain amount of seats that are supernumerarios. That means that additional to the 155, right? So that should be, I think they're basically, um, the groups represented in indigenous groups are saying around 24, a seats and then the Afro-descendant community was asking for one seat. And then also within that debate as well, there's also people with disabilities who are also asking for a certain amount of seats within that uh, amount of Escaño Reservados. Um, and that's really been a, a topic that is still not resolved, right? Just even recently in the last few days, it was in Comisión Mixta, the official parties on the on the right, they do not want the supernumerarios, right? They want it within the 155 seats. And so basically that also is setting up a position where now some people are in favor of gender parity or who are in favor of this 155 seats are saying, well, that wouldn't be fair that they would have this number in comparison to these other districts or also what happens with gender parity, et cetera. So it's really, it's, I think really going to the heart of a lot of the problems with the neoliberal, racist, eh, blanco mestizo state that's been set up in Chile since the 19th century, right? And I think to a certain extent, they see the Escaños Reservados, right, as a major threat to that political and economic elite. And the possibility, for example, of creating a uh, Estado Plurinacional eh, and having, for example, you know, one of the main sort of issues that's been brought up is the derechos del agua, right? You know, Chile, mm -hmm. they always say eh, Chile is the only country on earth that has its eh, privatized agua, right? Eh, water that's privatized. And I think that a lot of that also has to do with current demands from indigenous groups, especially in the South, that have had to do with rivers, lakes, eh, you know, traditional Mapuche territories. We had uh, in 2011, 2012 was all the protests against Hidro Aysen. There's also been a lot of protests with um, El Mayen, which is this river where the Mache um, Mijedai Wichalaf has also been very active in trying to protect that river. And I think that in general, sort of like there's been a lot of protest as well with regard to extractivism, right? So that's mining, that also has to do with thermoelectrics. And I think there's also been a few Mapuche women who have been very visible, right, and very present there. And I think about Macarena Valdez, who was killed, right? Um, but I also think about La Machi Francisca Linconao, right, who has also been a major figure for Mapuche groups and also feminist groups. And I think that La Machi Francisca, for example, and I, I'm going to close talking about her case, I think that it's a case that's been very visible. But she was a, a they, they tried her twice for the luxinger Mackay case, right, and in, in sort of accusing her of being involved in this fire that um, killed two big landowners in southern Chile. 
Um, and there's a lot of things to be said about that in terms of montajes on the part of the police, in the terms of, of how the uh, ley antiterrorista y seguro de estado are used in Chile, specifically with Mapuche groups. Um, and she uh, won a case in the, you know, the Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, right, which had to do with the fact that they tried her really without any evidence. And, um, and so she was ultimately clear that basically was between, I want to say, a four year process between like 2014 and 2018. She was finally cleared and now she went to try to vote at the end of October, right, um, for the, um, the, the plebiscite and they didn't allow her to vote. And they didn't allow her to vote because they said that she hadn't been cleared from these cases. And that was made national news. And part of that was her saying, I want to be a constituyente, right? Her saying that I want to present myself as well as a Mapuche woman, woman who's been, you know, so active in these struggles um, as a defensora del territorio, de las aguas, etc. And I think that that as well to me is just so clear that the figure of La Machi Francisca Lincolnau is like the nightmare of the Chilean right in terms of who they do not want in a convención constitucional. And so I think that it's so symbolic as well, the struggle for her to even you know vote <laughs> with regard to the convention and then also to try to become part of that convention and it, and from my point of view having somebody like la machi francisca i know there's also been some other mapuche women who have been thinking about presenting themselves for the convention constitucional i think would be so so important and i think that it would really signal a signal a major change in this sort of colonial racist history that we have in Chile, no? Um, but for that same re reason, it's going to be very, very contested and fought, I think, until the last moment by the political and economic elites in Chile. That's great, thank you, Hillary. I, I wanted to follow up because we've been talking a lot so far about the process uh, that is going to lead to the, to the new constitution, but we have a great question uh, from Brenda Elsie that came in through the chat uh, that focuses more on the constitution itself uh, when, it, when it's eventually rewritten. And I think uh, I'd like to pose this question if I can to Romina. Uh, Brenda asks, what are some of the constitutional provisions that could realistically change the current uh, socioeconomic model that has failed so many people? What would have to be in that constitution to really affect real change? Wow, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think there's some things that have been said already in terms of, for example, what uh, Hillary mentioned about the question of the privatized water has been actually a very kind of big, big question that has driven protests, uh, mentioned some of the individuals like Magdalena Valdez who've been murdered um, and has been kind of both a crossing of the environmental and Mapuche movements as well. And uh, from what I can see that from um, some of my friends who are very active in some of these social movements, I've seen the question of water come up a lot recently in terms of like they're, they're campaigning around that. Um, because they see that not as a, just a question of like access to water, but it's also has to do with indigenous sovereignty, has to do with other environmental questions like the forestry industry, the other things they can see how it would then permeate, right? Um, now there's, I would say there's a, also, I, um, I know a lot of these things are still in discussion and debate. But there, um, you know, there are questions like th that specific social movements are discussing, I would say in the feminist movement, uh, there is also tr trying to see like how we can have an impact on this like new constitution, like how can we, uh, you cannot legislate out patriarchy, right, you can <laughs> legislate out uh, femicides. Um, but you can try to put certain provisions in place that would like try to improve the lives of working class women, for example, of indigenous women, of immigrant women. Uh, there's also the immigration laws have become more draconian over the last like 10 years. And there is also that discussion about how to create change. Um, uh, you know, to 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 institute that as part of like questions of human rights, uh, rights of migration, 
and also those of us like myself who are who are um, I'm Chilean American, so I'm a, I'm a, uh, I am you know citizen of both countries. Uh, there's always been a lot of laws kind of like limiting my ability to vote, limiting my, you know, I could, I was able, in quotation, I was able to vote maybe uh, in this first round, but it was very, very difficult. You had to sign up very early on. Most of my friends in Los Angeles who are Chilean, we were not able to vote, even though we went to the consulate to hang out and stand there and have our presence known. Uh, but we won't be able to vote if we're in the United States. We won't be able to vote again for the con any aspects of the Constitution. We would have to be in Chile. And so we know this has to do with the legacy of those many of us who are like ch children of exiles uh, that, you know, why these limitations of like voting rights. Uh, and, uh, I, and I think there is a question of like, dem you know, like democratic kind of like ability to vote in Chile uh, is, is, is still a question. Part of it has to do with people being disillusioned, uh, but the other part is to do with like questions of access uh, and limitations. But I, you know, it's, uh, it's still, I, I think, um, well, I tend to be uh, n not as pessimistic, I think, because uh, living between the United States and Chile, I think, I'm so much more optimistic about what I see happening in Chile in comparison to the United States. So I'm like, oh, what's happening there actually seems so much better than what's happening here. Um, but I think that really the what gives me hope is that the social movements have, that have created this moment and have created the kind of like the public discourse on these various topics that they're happening um, will uh, will not uh go unheard like they they want to be heard and if they're not if they're pushed out of the process they will there will be funas there will be protests there will be march there will be attempts to to make themselves like be part of the process even though um they're if they're like excluded somehow so i i still think there's a really great possibility of some individuals who can who have been leaders in the social movements to present themselves as you know having being part of the constituent assembly and uh, also um and just like another aspect that uh in chile in my neighborhood i've been i was i've been very active in my neighborhood assembly uh which i think they're there are a lot of neighborhood assemblies right now across Chile and uh, that came out of the protests of 2019. And those there's this debates happening there. I mean, I'm still on the, the what's up. I can't do very much from afar, but I see the debates happening within my small little neighborhood uh, of these questions. Like, how are we going to help? Who are we going to support? Who are we going to rally for? You know, so I still think this is a this is a process in the making, and debates are happening. So uh, there's, I think there are some realistic possibilities of these changes happening. Yeah. Thank you so much, Romina. And another kind of following up with Claudio to think about what kind of change might be possible ahead. This is a question from Lisa Di Giovanni uh, asking if you could speak to the current state of compulsory military service in Chile. <laughs> Could this not also be an important area for change? To what degree do you think conscription perpetuates the power of the Chilean military, the hegemony of patriarchy, and class divides? Um, in terms of, uh, can I step in a little on the previous question of Brenda's and uh, Cynthia? Uh, just in terms of what provisions should be made in, terms, uh, in the new constitution to change the, the economic model that, uh, as uh, Brenda has failed so many. Uh, I think one of the major changes that should be introduced in the new constitution should be the concept of state. What kind of state do we do we want for, for the future? And what kind of state do we want to be written in black and white in the new constitution? Uh, in terms of, because most of the neoliberal system in Chile is based on the idea of the subsidiary state or the entrepreneurial state. So if we change that, uh, if, we, if we create a constitution that recognizes uh, Pueblos uh, originarios or indigenous peoples that uh, recognize uh, different kinds of uh, rights, like collective rights. Now, in 2003, in, in 2003, under uh, President uh, Lagos, there was created this uh, new um, 
this uh, truth commission called the uh, uh, Commission de Verdad Histórica y Nuevo Trato con los Pueblos Indígenas, the Truth Commission of New Truth, of New Truth, a new, pa new pact with the indigenous uh, indigenous people. It wasn't a good, uh, it wasn't the, uh, the greatest uh, 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 truth commission, but in, but the, uh, the only part that I really liked about that uh, was the, the, the last part, uh, the suggestions uh, to the state uh, on what the state should have uh, Done in terms of uh, reparation with uh, between the uh, between the violent relations between the state and the indigenous people, especially the Mapuche people, and uh, it it suggested uh, revising the whole uh, legislation on uh, individual rights to demand and uh, create a new system of collective rights. Uh, and so, uh, what provisions should we uh, create for the new constitution? Is a new state a state that uh, really ensure social rights, access to education, access to uh, public access to health, uh, a new, we need totally a new uh, social security system. And therefore also, we, we also need recognition, totally full recognition of indigenous people living in our country. Uh, and in, in, when, once we do that, uh, we will start revising all the system of uh, land, water rights, and uh, timber. You know the the uh, DL two two hundred one uh, seven hundred one. Sorry, uh, that legislating terms of the timber industry. Uh, because right now, uh, private investors are uh, they can do whatever they want, but whatever is on on the soil, because Chile and state is only owner of the subsoil, of the natural resources. So. Once we change that, when we uh, uh, the model will start uh, changing a little. We are not going to demand for the uh, neoliberal system. It's like perfectly how can we get rid of it in uh, uh, in, in, in 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 a short term process. But uh, we can start by uh, creating a, a new concept of the state of a, a state socially committed. Like we had a, a salary compromiso in the 40s and 50s, and it didn't work so badly. <laughs> so uh, we have the, the historical experience, right? Uh, Kevin Rosenberg can say a lot about that. And uh, so I think uh, that's, uh, that that's will be some of the provisions that I would say we should address in the new constitution. And in terms of the um, military uh, uh, security service, uh, well, I totally agree with all your with all you're saying. <laughs> it's totally, it, it totally reinforced patriarchy. It's totally reinforced. Uh, the, uh, there are some uh, places for women in the army and in different armed forces, but still, it's uh, the the inclusion of women in the in, in the armed forces has created uh, some spaces for certain uh, stereotypes of women, certain stereotypes of uh, female role, and to, and, I, and I think totally uh, reinforced patriarchy and totally reinforced. Uh, different uh, accepted uh, and hegemonic forms of masculinity within the compulsory uh, army, and at the same time, it's also a class system. Totally, uh, 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 the the official schools of the military official schools, uh, uh, it's a it's, it's a high class school, school. Also, the navy, also the, the the air forces, and every single area of the armed forces, they have the official schools. And the superficial schools and the superficial schools are poor people. <laughs> it's, it's mostly it's mostly poor people and people who uh, get into the compository uh, service in Chile. It's also the poorest people in the urban centers in and in, in, uh, in the in the big cities and the poorest people in the countryside, especially in the countryside. I grew up in the countryside and most of my friends when I was uh, while I was growing up, I was hoping getting into college and all my friends were like, oh, I, I hope to get into the army so I can get a job. So it's uh, it's a matter of survival also for, for for the poorest part of the population. So it's a totally class system that segregates people into different ranks of the uh, armed forces and with the hope and the promise of some uh, kind of technical skill to get some jobs afterwards. So uh, it's totally, uh, and, and what, uh, what's, uh, what is the situation right now? Well, the it's uh, it's it's still compulsory, uh, but you can um, do it ahead. If you are a student, you can do it ahead in the summers. Or uh, there's a there's a certain amount of people that it's called to the to the compulsory service. But uh, most people from the uh, middle class and upper middle classes they don't get into the uh, compulsory service. Is you can totally avoid. I totally I did. I I, I avoided it 
then my whole life. And when they called me, it was too old to get into it. So it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, 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 and I was already with you know, undergrad and grad school. So it's, uh, it's very, for people from middle class and upper classes, it's very easy to get out of it. Uh, it's poor people who get stuck on it. And uh, they're, uh, it's, totally, it's a totally patriarchal system, but it's also a, an homophobic system. But at the same time, during the 90s and the, and, and the last decade, several uh, accusations, uh, there were several accusations some of them got to the legal system in, in which uh, young uh, men were raped into the, uh, inside the barracks of the, uh, of the armed forces. So it's, uh, it's, it's not just uh, a perpetuation of patriarchy in terms of the whole society, it's also a perpetuation of an internal system of patriarchy in which uh, there are different ranks of masculine, masculine adults, not just military ranks, but military, uh, different ranks of masculinity also. So, subordinated to others. So, that would say. Wonderful, thank you so much, Claudio. Uh, I, unfortunately, I, I'm the one who has the job of uh, bringing the session to a close. We're right at one o'clock right now, uh, but uh, clearly we, we still have many questions uh, from the audience that we haven't gotten to. And I think what we've learned is that there, there's so much passion, so many people thinking with, uh, Chile and in solidarity with Chile and, and, and very vested in this uh, really momentous time. And I know the other way around as well, that uh, those from Chile are thinking in solidarity right now with the processes that are uh, going on in the US <laughs> as well. So uh, I, I, think, I think it warrants a follow-up conversation. So hopefully we can do another event uh, in the not too distant future to keep the conversation going. But thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you again to the DHI and to all the co-sponsors and uh, always a pleasure to be with my uh, colleague Marion Schlauterbeck uh, to, uh, to moderate the session. So thanks to everybody. Stay well and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Cuídense. Well, talk, Hilary.